today's scripture reading comes from John 20, 24 to 29. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen me and yet have believed. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. Please join me in prayer for the Lord. Lord, we thank you so much for your faithfulness to us. We thank you, Lord, that you are a God who is always with us, and we acknowledge that you are with us even now, right now. And so, Lord, this time as we hear your word, we pray that you would illuminate your truth into our hearts and into our lives through your Holy Spirit, that we, as your people, as your disciples, as your followers, may live according to your word and your truth every day in our lives to ultimately give you glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Christ is still risen. Christ is still risen indeed. <laughs> we continue in the Easter tide, celebrating the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and his victory over sin. I think a lot of times we spend so much time in anticipation of Easter, and once we actually have Easter and it passes, we kind of just, like, you know, be like, oh, that's it, right? We kind of forget about it. But there is another season after Easter. It's called Easter Tide, and we celebrate this as much as we do Lent. Just as we spent 40 days before Easter in preparation, in meditating, the Lord's suffering, and leading up to Easter, let us now spend the next 40 days after Easter doing the same in meditating on the resurrection of Christ and the life that we have in him. Today's New Testament account in John, it occurs just a week after the resurrection of Christ. Just a prior week, we know that Jesus revealed himself to Mary, Mary Magdalene. And this was a passage that we actually read on Easter Sunday. I hope you all remember. And so after seeing Jesus, Mary, what does she do? She rushes to the disciples to tell them what she has seen and what she had experienced. She tells the disciples that the Lord is risen and that he has conquered the grave. Yet, it seems that the disciples do not believe in Mary's testimony. Again, in the Gospel of Luke, we read of another account where the resurrected Christ, Jesus, and he meets two disciples who are on their way to Emmaus. And once they realize, right, that who it, who it is, that this is Jesus, that he is risen. It is their Lord. They rush back to Jerusalem, and they also tell that they have seen the Lord, and they tell that to the disciples, right? But we see, unfortunately, they still, the disciples, they do not believe them. They don't believe the testimony of Mary, and they don't believe the testimony of those two other disciples who are on their way to Emmaus, even though they have actually seen Jesus. But it was not until that very night, with the doors locked, that Jesus comes into the presence of the disciples, minus Thomas, and it's important to note because we're going to be talking about that later, but Jesus, he reveals himself to the disciples, and it's here where we read that the disciples finally believe that Jesus is risen. 
When the other disciples now in turn, they realize Jesus is risen. And so they go to tell Thomas, who was not with them. So they explain to him all that happened, how they saw the resurrected Christ and Jesus is in fact risen from the grave. However, Thomas, he doubted. Right? He was a skeptic. He did not believe them. And so this is how he replies in today's passage. Unless I see in his hand the mark of the nails and place my finger into the marks of the nails and place my hands in his side, I will never believe. What a brazen, what an audacious response by Thomas. Thomas, who is one of Jesus' disciples, one of Jesus' very own disciple, he did not believe. He did not believe even when Mary testified, even when those two disciples testified, even when those brothers, his brothers, who have followed Jesus with, when they testified, Thomas did not believe. And not only did he not believe, but he said, unless I touch his wounds, I will never believe. And so from this account, we know he has an infamous title that's given to him, doubting Thomas, right? And so whenever we do something, you know, or whenever we're doubtful, we say, don't be a doubting Thomas, right? Have we all not said that before? No? But <laughs> it's like a condescending title. But my question for us this morning, for all of us, is was Thomas a greater doubter than the rest? Was Thomas a greater doubter than the rest of the disciples and rest of us here today? And the answer is no. And here's why. First of all, the others we see doubted just as much as Thomas. As I already mentioned, they didn't believe that Jesus was risen, even through Mary's testimony and even through the other two disciples' testimony. Their firsthand testimony that they had seen the risen Christ the other disciples didn't believe them as well. In fact, it wasn't until Jesus presented himself to the disciples and showed them his wounds that they finally, that's when they first believed that Jesus is risen. So the disciples are not off the hook, right? Because they also didn't believe until they actually saw the wounds of Jesus. Also, to the credit of Thomas, when Jesus returned, we read in John that the doors were locked. See, most scholars will agree that the disciples would have kept their doors locked because they were still afraid. They were still afraid of being, you know, a persecution. They were still afraid of being arrested. They were still afraid being the disciples of Jesus Christ, they were still afraid. How could they be so, like, scared? And so even after, remember this is a week after they had that encounter with Jesus, the other disciples, they still locked their doors, which means that they were still afraid and that they hid in fear. All this is to say that just because Thomas's confession, right, I will never believe I think he gets a worse reputation than the other disciples. Because I think when we think about it, right, we don't say, oh, that doubting Peter. We don't say, oh, that doubting John. But in fact, we say, what do we say? We say, oh, it's the John, the rock. It's, or the other way around, it's Peter, the John, or rock. The John, the beloved disciple of Jesus. But when it comes to Thomas, what do we say? It's that doubting Thomas, like automatically. Right? He's doubting Thomas, oh my goodness. But if anything, Thomas isn't more of a doubter than the other disciples. If anything, all of them were equally faithless. They were all doubters. So why is Thomas 
singled out? Why do all the other disciples seem like they're not talking about uh, their own experience where they denied, you know, or they did not believe in Jesus' resurrection? But then Thomas is singled out for his doubt, for his confession. I will never believe. Well, the reason why, of course, is because Jesus was trying to teach the disciples a lesson. And Jesus is trying to teach us a lesson through this encounter with Thomas. You see, what we have to realize about this story about doubting Thomas is that the story is not about Thomas. But this story is about Jesus. Just like everything else in the Bible, it may seem like the story is all about, you know, Abraham or the story is all about Moses. The story is all about, you know, other characters in the Bible. But everything in the Bible is actually about God. And it points us to Jesus and who he is. And just like that, the story is given to us even today so that we would know how Jesus loves us so much. The grace that he has for us and the character of Jesus, who he is. Not just so that we can judge Thomas. It's not why the story is given to us. We know that the disciples didn't understand. They didn't understand that Jesus would rise again. And if we can remember constantly throughout Jesus' ministry, Jesus told the disciples that I'm going to die and I'm going to resurrect in three days. And constantly the disciples would say, Jesus, what are you talking about? That doesn't make any sense. Peter was like, no, oh, Jesus, you can't do that. Not on my watch. All these things. They didn't understand that Jesus would die and that he would resurrect. And in fact, he told them, if we can remember, Jesus told the disciples blatantly that he would destroy. He, he says, I will destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. What are you talking about, Jesus? You're not making any sense. We understand that the disciples, before they saw Jesus, before they encountered Jesus, were just as clueless as we were before we met Jesus and encountered Jesus. And so their disbelief, their doubt in the resurrection of Jesus, it's not more heinous. It's not worse than our doubt, our skepticism, our unbelief before we knew Jesus. Jesus' intention was to make himself known to his disciples so that they would know his resurrection and that he would believe in him and that he would commission them as his apostles. To go where and to do what? To go to Judea, right? Or Jerusalem, Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth to proclaim the gospel. We know that God knows everything. Think about that. He knows all. God is omniscient. So if, you, if we think about it in that sense, Jesus could have chosen a time where all the disciples have gathered together in a room, including Thomas, and he could have just, you know, appeared before the disciples and just be like, peace be with you. Here are my wounds. You see them. And then the disciples would probably have, you know, believed his resurrection like automatically. But he intentionally, deliberately chose to come at a time where all of them were together except Thomas. And this is to show us how much he loves us. Why? On that night, a week after his resurrection, when he came to the disciples again, he came deliberately for Thomas. He wanted to let Thomas know that he's commissioning him as an apostle, that he's calling him still as his disciple. He came deliberately to give Thomas faith, to show him how much he loves him. He came deliberately to show Thomas the wounds that he bore for him. When Jesus came into the presence of the disciples, he already knew Thomas's doubt. 
Jesus already knew about his confession. I will never believe. Jesus already knew his skepticism. And so, as Jesus comes into the disciples, the presence of the disciples, he immediately goes to Thomas and he says this in our passage that we read today. Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. And then he says, do not disbelieve, but believe. I don't know about you, but I believe in that moment, Thomas, he didn't even have to touch Jesus' wounds because Thomas, he says, he exclaims, my Lord, my God. And this isn't just an honorary title that he's giving to Jesus right now. He's not trying to show respect to Jesus. He's making it personal by saying, you are my Lord, you are my God. It's a vast contrast to the confession that he makes to the disciples when he says, I will never believe. But once he sees, once he sees that it's Jesus, that it's his his Lord, his confession goes from, I will never believe, to, you are my Lord, you are my God. It seems that Thomas's faith was in fact no worse than the rest of the disciples. It's no worse than our faith, and yet Jesus still comes to Thomas, and we see him purposefully reaching out to him to give him faith. And he said to him, Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. This message, this story is for all of Jesus' disciples, then and now. Many believed in Jesus because they saw the resurrected Lord, because they saw Jesus. Remember, for 40 days, he revealed himself to hundreds of disciples. He taught them the scriptures, the laws of Moses, and the prophets, and they believed in him because they actually saw Jesus with their own bare eyes. And Jesus says, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. For us, this is a story of our own doubt, our doubt in God, our doubt in a Savior, our doubt in a resurrected Christ, but at the same time, it is a story of God's grace to us, even in the midst of our doubt. This story is a story of our ignorance and indifference towards God, yet God's steadfast love for us, for all of us. Because, you see, we are all like these disciples who did not believe in Jesus. We're all like this Thomas who doubted because have we all not doubted God at some point in our lives? Have we all not doubted his love? Have we all not doubted who he is and who we are in him at some point in our lives, especially in this generation of skepticism, in our generation of this postmodern generation where it seems that you have to be suspicious of everything. In our generation, our age, it tells us that we have to question everything. And all the answers, all of the truth must be subjective and relative, which means that there is really no truth. And so even a lot of scholars, they have come up with these you know, theories, right? Oh, Jesus' disciples, they, they actually removed Jesus' body from the tomb, and that's why you know, people weren't able to uh, find Jesus' body. Oh, it's because the disciples, they were dreaming. They were having an illusion. All these things. All to say, you can still doubt these things. You can still doubt the resurrection of Christ. And that's okay because you can still be a Christian. But how 
can we believe in redemption, in salvation, and the covering and the washing of the blood of Jesus without resurrection and Christ defeating the grave? But that's how it is. That even with all these eyewitness accounts, with all the historical evidence, with all the writers, you know, being merely decades within the frame of, frame of Jesus' ministry, all these things, the validity of the writings, the validity of Christ's resurrection and Christianity, all these things in general, it's so hard to believe in Christ. It's so hard to believe in Jesus. And we can see that easily when we walk out the door. When we go into the world, we see so many people who doubt, doubt about Jesus' resurrection, those people who do not believe. We even see in many churches, those people who do not believe and doubt. So then, how can we believe? How are you and I sitting here worshiping God? How are we praising God for the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ? I think Paul states it perfectly in Ephesians chapter 2. He says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. We are truly blessed. Not because we have seen Jesus, right, being physically resurrected no but we're even more blessed than those disciples because we don't have to see a physical resurrection of christ yet we still believe and why does that make us more blessed because god in his sovereignty and his grace has given us more faith to believe in the resurrection of christ even without seeing him if we ought to learn anything about this passage, it's not that Thomas is a great doubter, but that God gives even more faith, faith even to the greatest doubter to believe in him, all in his will, for his purpose, and his glory. The story is not about doubting Thomas, but the story is about our gracious Jesus who gives us faith course that doesn't mean that we can go around and doubting jesus his resurrection at times there is validity to our doubts when we are non-believing we have doubts maybe we're struggling maybe we're immature in faith maybe we're a new convert or whatever it may be there is validity at times for our doubts yet if you truly know, if you have truly experienced the resurrection of Christ, if God has given you saving faith, then God calls us to stop doubting, to doubt no longer, and to believe. When we truly have the saving faith in Christ, we don't question who God is any longer. We don't question who we are in him any longer but we have assurance in our identity in him. We have assurance in the righteousness that he has imputed to us. We have assurance of the salvation that only he can give to us. In the book of Mark and Luke, we read that Jesus actually rebukes his disciples for doubting. In Mark, we read, Afterward, he appeared to the eleven themselves as they were reclining at table, and he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. And then Luke, he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? As those who have been called by God, as those who have been given this faith, a saving faith in Christ, we are to believe and doubt no longer. God has given his own son, Jesus Christ, to us, and he has given us his word 
the very testimony of his own disciples that we might believe that Jesus Christ is the Lord and that by believing we might have life in his name more than that today he has also given us his Holy Spirit and it is through the Holy Spirit that we have assurance of faith and salvation in Jesus Christ this Holy Spirit who is a seal the guarantee of our inheritance and so let us have full assurance full faith without a doubt that Jesus is a Christ and that he has given us salvation through his blood you know this is why I love reformed theology and this is the part of the reason why I kind of like Calvinism not that I want to belong to the cult group right but because I believe that once God has given you the saving faith he will not take it away from you and you cannot lose it we look through all these examples none of them deserved to be saved you can clearly see that right the disciples they didn't deserve to be forgiven or to have given faith what about Thomas did he deserve to have faith he didn't deserve to be given faith but what about us we do not deserve to have salvation in the Lord it is only God's to us and he does not take it away because of his grace and because of his mercy to us we're elected chosen and adopted as heirs to Almighty God and his love for us is unconditional in the sense that he will never take it away from us knowing this and knowing Christ I cannot tell you or I cannot teach that you can lose your salvation if he has given you faith it is not mine to take it away of course sometimes we doubt God we rebuke him we even try to turn away from him because we're sinners and I don't know if I can say this but because we're dumb but that's not why we're saved I was saved based on my intellect based on my character based on my actions I'm being in big trouble right now but God saves me because of his purpose and his will because of his grace and his mercy and love to me quickly I want to share my story of doubt hopefully it'll encourage you when I was grade 10 uh, my dad found out that he had a swollen lymph in his neck area and he was not coughing and you already know that's not a good sign and so obviously he went to the hospital had a body checkup blood test all that thing and then the hospital called him to come back the next week you know that's like bad because especially in Canada you have to wait forever and the other case is that you know you just don't get a call back from the hospital which is good but that wasn't the case for my dad and so my family went back to the hospital and met the doctor and it turned out that uh, my dad had stage 3 nasal cancer with a 30% survival rate and he had to undergo chemo and radiation therapy and when we first heard that my family we were just devastated on our way back home from the hospital in the car everyone just silently cried no one spoke a word and then even when we arrived home no one got out of the car we just sat there and we all cried together but strangely bad things always come together isn't it I don't know whether it was because of my father's sudden illness but the situation worsened as my sister went through a mental breakdown to the point where she suffered from major depression now can you imagine being in a home with two serious patients who are both undergoing intense treatment 
It was just too much to bear. Every day after school, I didn't want to go back home. I went back home late and purposely. Why? Because of the atmosphere. Like it was depressing. It was almost like death was all around us. It was a really sad and tough time. I mean, if I can just share with you one thing that I find the most challenging that we were going through that. My family couldn't even eat together properly because my dad's treatments were so intense that his body just refused to take the food in. And so every single time, whatever he swallows, he would just vomit. He would just vomit every time. But he had to swallow in order to survive and fight the cancer. It was a very low, depressing, and a very sad and angry point in my life. And I was young. I was both immature as a person and immature as a Christian. And in my maturity, I tried to run away from God. And I did everything I could to renounce God because I felt like God did not exist. I doubted. Because some of you know, but my parents, they have devotedly sacrificed themselves, dedicated themselves for their whole life to serve the Lord, serve the people, serve the church, even planted churches. But this is what my family had to go through. Are you kidding me, God? How are you loving? How are you gracious? I feel like he didn't exist because why else would these tragedies happen to my family? I didn't want to believe in him. And so I stopped paying attention on Sunday during worship services. I stopped reading my Bible. I stopped praying. I even started hanging out with the wrong crowd. And I was angry at God after a while. But one night, I woke up um, in the middle of the night at around 3 a.m. to go to the bathroom. It was all dark, couldn't see anything. But I heard someone crying. I go, what's that? Then when I heard it again, it was someone praying out loud. It was my mom, even though I couldn't see her in the dark. And trust me, she was praying desperately. And I've never seen anyone praying like that, like until this point. And I was completely shocked. I mean, how could someone pray to God like that when there is no such thing as God? But at the same time, I realized at that moment that, okay, if God does not exist, then my mom is doing that for nothing. But it must be real. It's got to be real. Because the way she prayed and cried out to God, it just had to be real. Otherwise, just she was a crazy woman talking to herself, crying out. Talking to herself in the night when everybody else is sleeping at 3 a.m. And I wonder if I was God, saw my mom praying like that desperately, I would definitely answer her prayer. So I said to myself, okay, I'm going to pray wholeheartedly. I'm not going to fake it, but I'm going to give my all. And if God doesn't answer my prayer, I'm not going to believe it. Still stubborn as I can be. And I'm going to renounce my faith in God. I'm going to stop believing in God. And so what I did from that night and every night I prayed wholeheartedly. I kneel down on my knees every single time. Not a single time I didn't sit down and pray. Not a single, I didn't stand, but I kneeled down on my knees, desperately pray to God. And every night when I was genuinely, desperately praying to God alone in my room, believe it or not, I was able to feel his presence. I was comforted. And this peace just filled my heart and I. I knew that God was there listening to my prayer. 
And thankfully, God healed my father's cancer and my sister's illness. And God obviously restored my faith. And I still thank the Lord for that. Not just simply because God answered my prayer, but because he has given me assurance and the true living hope in Christ Jesus, where I know he will continue to shine his light in the darkness in my life. Sometimes we doubt. Sometimes we try to run away from God. If that's what you need to do like me, then do it. But I guarantee you, God's not going to come to you with lightning and fire or hail if you're genuine. And sometimes even if you're not like I was, simply because he is gracious, because he's loving and he's kind, he will come to us as he did to me every night. And he will show us his wounds, those nails that were meant for you and me. He will show us his scars and he will say to us, as he did to me at that time and as he did to Thomas so many years ago, he will say, put your finger here and see my hand and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And so, let us doubt no longer. As Peter encouraged us, let us long for pure spiritual milk that by it we may grow up into salvation. Let us be built up into the spiritual house, a holy priesthood, that we may see all of the Lord's, whatever that he's doing in our lives, that we may believe. On our Easter service a few weeks ago, we read from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses uh, 55 to 57, the victory of Christ over the grave and sin. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of the sin is a law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through his grace, through his mercy, he has given us victory through Jesus Christ. But this week, let us continue and read verse 58 that says, Therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Let us, as children of God, as people of God, doubt no longer. Let us be steadfast, and immovable that we may experience the work of God through our church, through our families, our community, and that we may praise him and give him all of the glory that he deserves. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for your steadfast love your kindness to us that even in our doubt even though we are like thomas where we doubt you and sometimes we try to run away and yet in your grace in your love for us you continue to call us as your children your people you continue to give us more faith you continue to sanctify us even when we don't even deserve and so we praise you god we thank you for that we pray that you continue to give us more faith, continue, Lord, to move in us, help us to be steadfast and immovable as your people, that you may continue to work through us and that you may continue to receive glory through your church and through your people, through us. We pray this in your mighty name, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat>